join me in welcoming Victor Glover. Okay, so I have to apologize for playing with the emotions. The whole lights off thing, I did not do that. <laughs> I was looking around like, is Colonel Cabana coming? I don't know. <laughs> um, thank you, it's, it's awesome to be here. And as David said, I'm one of NASA's newest astronauts. Uh, apparently they take anybody now, so. Um, yeah, they just hand us that book and we have two years to master it. Um, it's an honor to be here, it really is. Um, I am the, the crew office GSDO lead. I don't know if any of you work for GSDO. So I come here a lot. And I come here because I love being at Kennedy Space Center. I mean, it just, it's, it's the, the, the gateway to, to human space flight. It's, it's such a special place. And I love the banner that you guys have on your website. Uh, it just kind of encapsulates all that for me. And as a military guy, I've been in the Navy for almost 20 years now, which is weird. but. I've been some pretty unique places, and Kennedy ranks right up there with some of the most profound places that I've been in my professional life. Um, I was fortunate to fly jets across the Pacific from Japan to California and land at Wake Island, this small coral reef in the middle of the open ocean. And I got to stay there for a couple of nights, um, paddling across the uh, little bay in the middle of the island there next to the runway, looking at the pillboxes and the gun emplacements. It was just profound. And they have signs on the beach that say, if you come across bones or any human remains, leave them in place out of respect for the dead. And it's interesting uh, to go to a place that has signs like that all around. Another place is Pearl Harbor. That's the USS Arizona Memorial, which still seeps oil up to the surface to this day. For me, because you can walk up closer to it if you can get on the base, the USS Utah Memorial, even more profound, because you can stand right there and look, and you can see that's a ship. There's no memorial built on top of it. That is just the ship lying in situ where it, where it was sunk. And again, another special place that I've been fortunate to visit. And one of the most unique places, being stationed on a carrier in Japan, uh, the Japanese government doesn't like us to do all of our touch and goes over Tokyo. So they actually send us to what they refer to as Iwoto, or what we called Iwo Jima. And I got to run up Mount Suribachi and take some sand from the beach and uh, look at the memorial up there. And oh, it, 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 I'm not even a history buff. And, and this place just, it is ingrained. Uh, just being there and seeing the landscape and imagining fighting and living there and being there for so long. And the reason I'm sharing these places with you is because Kennedy Space Center is like that for me. But there's something special about Kennedy Space Center among those other places that I mentioned. It didn't take a war and mass casualties for Kennedy Space Center to become that kind of special place for me and for thousands of hundreds of thousands of people. Um, we do something very special here. And I say we because that's kind of the point of my talk. And this is kind of three parts. Please forgive me. I, I, like I said, I come here a lot. And I love being here. And I don't get to do this often, though. I'm usually in a meeting. And it's you know, you GSDO folks, you understand. Uh, what I'm talking about. So this is an opportunity for me to actually talk to you and get to know you. So that's what my point. So if it seems like I'm going to talk about a lot of random things, that's on purpose. And maybe if I get to come out here more often, we can have a little bit more focus. But I'm going to talk to you about everything that I think uh, this morning or this afternoon. And so one of them is how important Kennedy Space Center is uh, to everybody and to me especially. And my class came here for a visit. And standing there, it was one of the most profound moments of my professional life. I mean, I have four daughters, so seeing my kids born uh, is the most profound thing I've ever done. But this ranks right up there with it, to stand there. Uh, and like I said, the fact that we've achieved this, we've had, we've taken our lumps, right? But to, to, to be able to reach that kind of significance for so many people by doing something to benefit everybody that, that didn't involve a war, that's special. And I hope you don't take that for granted by being here. Because if you do, you can go to Houston and I'll come here and take your place. I love being here, if I haven't said that already. And that's why I'm here for you all. Don't ask me who's in this picture. I don't know. I found it on the internet. <laughs> I was trying to figure out a way, actually, and there's a way to do this. I just don't have the technology. But I can actually take my phone and then put, uh, you know, s scan the room and it'll show it up there. I don't have, I, don't, I couldn't figure that one out. And you're like, really? Yeah, yeah, I know. They might send me to Mars, but I couldn't figure that out. <laughs> but the point is, is that I'm here for you. 
right? And I'm sorry that you guys all have to stand here and look at me up here, but I'm here for you. And so hopefully we can get to know each other uh, in the next hour or so. And I won't belabor you too much, but Kennedy Space Center is special to all of us. There are 47 of us in that office, and this place is special. We get it. I mean, it's like the kids going to mom and dad saying, can we borrow the car? And we promise to bring, bring it back empty in this case. But we realize <laughs> how much you do for us, and we are so grateful. And so from, from JSC, I'm sending you all a big hug uh, to our KSC family. And that's kind of the point I really want to make is how important family is and how important that relationship is. One team, one fight. We're all trying to do the same thing. If you go to the GSDO meetings, you may not agree, but that's, we are all trying to do the same thing. So I want to take you really quickly through my background. I asked him not to read too much. I was born in Southern California, and those were pictures of my cousins, a fireman, a preacher, and a, multi, or a mixed martial artist fighter. I went to high school in Ontario, Southern California, not far from, from Los Angeles. And I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Is this thing like? Does this sound strange? OK. I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And uh, I love that picture at the top because that picture is my then girlfriend and I tutoring elementary and junior high school students about how to make mousetrap cars and how to build bridges. And I played football. I wrestled in college. I was a Division I athlete. But this is what I did in my free time because it was important to me then, just like it is now. And that lady would go on to become my wife and the mother of those four little girls uh, that we follow around all the time. And uh, <laughs> so that was actually how our relationship started, was going around talking to young folks about the importance of what you do. Graduated from Cal Poly and anchors away. I joined the Navy. I was commissioned in 99. I got my wings in 2001. I learned to fly the F-18, and I went into my first operational squadron. Uh, in 2003. This is a picture over Lake Tharthar. This is a picture from the air refueling aircraft. This is me just popping a flare. That's not a bomb or a missile. It's just a flare. It was a photo uh, X. But this is me behind the tanker over Lake Tharthar in Iraq. That's where we would air refuel. I was there, if you remember what they called Operation uh, Al Fajr, was the, you, what, or you might remember it being called Phantom Fury. It's when the Marines took over the city of Fallujah in 2004. That was the operation that we were there for for six months, deployed in the Northern Arabian Gulf. Um, uh, the Navy has been so good to me. So, so many interesting experiences, being able to fly this jet off of a carrier. I went to test pilot school. That's a picture of me flying a glider, getting ready to put in a step input to see what control response we get. So that's why my leg was up on the dash. And then I went and flew test missions for a couple of years, and then to school a couple of times, and then back to the fleet. And this is a picture of me in my last squadron uh, landing a Super Hornet on the George Washington, the USS George Washington. And um, that was a very special squadron. So this jet you see in the picture is an F-18E Super Hornet. This, wow, yeah, that's a beautiful machine. <laughs> a beautiful machine. And um, if you're not familiar with the carrier, there's four cables, and you notice where I'm landing. There's not a cable. You see them kind of evenly spaced out. The one farthest back is number one. Then the next one's number two. We target the three wire. And because that's the one people hit mostly, we have to change them out. So they happen to change it out. So what I'm telling you is I, this was a good landing, even though there's no wire there for me to grab. I wound up grabbing number four. But it wasn't my fault. Uh, I love flying this machine. And so um, I, I'm, I'm going to come back to uh, why I left this picture up there so long in a little while. But uh, that is uh, not long after that, the fly-off. Uh, one of the most inspiring things we do is we fly all of our jets off the carrier, and we bring them all home at once. And our families are there. My kids run out and give hugs. And then uh, you know somebody's walking around with the camera and takes this picture. But this picture is my favorite picture. It's on everything. It's on my desk, on my shelf. It's on my computer screensaver, because there's so much wrapped up into this picture. And so one of the reasons I'm sharing it with you, trying to get to know you, this is the most important stuff in my life, personally, obviously, and professionally. That thing that you see there behind me means so much to me. And it, it's because it's a symbol. Just like if you buy a Houston Starbucks mug, you know what's on it? Longhorns, an oil rig, and the space shuttle. Because the space shuttle is an icon. That F-18, it's not about the machine, the, the composites and the radar, the electronics, the batteries. It's the 225 people that make that thing run. That's what it represents to me. And that's why this picture encapsulates so much for me. When I got this job, 
I was working in Congress, so we left Japan, went to DC, and I didn't want to work in the five-sided house of pain, <clears throat> which you know is the Pentagon. <laughs> so, so I applied for a fellowship, and I got lucky, and I got to work in Congress for a couple of years. And this was the high point. And I'm, I haven't even told you who I work for, but this man, civil rights icon, Congressman John Lewis, is my hero. And I got to sit down with him. I called his office and said, hey, I, well, I'm a staffer over in the Senate. I work for so and so. I just want to come meet your boss. And the chief of staff said, what? Come on over. And I walked over, walked. And I worked. You see the Capitol? It's between the House and the Senate. I worked in the Senate, which is on the other side, how far we are from the Capitol, this direction, the other side. And I walked, and I went and got to sit there and talk to him on the balcony. This is one of, again, another one of those profound moments. This is what I was doing when I got selected for this awesome gig. And this is who I work for. And one of the best bosses I've ever had. This isn't about politics. It's about leadership and working for him. Every day I got to talk to this man about leadership. He saw every three and four star general admiral in our military. And we used to sit down one on one in his office and talk about leadership. Again, but boy, the Navy was very good to me. And that's what I was doing when I got this gig. And so. Not a, bad, uh, not a bad gig. This has been a blast. Two years. I'm going to run you through some of the stuff that we've done in these last two years to share. Hopefully, you've seen some of this before. But if you haven't, boy, uh, you need to come to Houston so I can show it to you in person. And I will. I love giving tours. So if you make it to Houston, I will give you a tour. So I was I'm one of the newest, newest astronauts, part of the 21st class, the 2013 class of astronaut candidates back then. and. Um, we got to do some really neat things. And I can't put it all into this presentation, but I'll talk to you a little bit about what we did. We had to learn Russian. I speak it a little bit, but in my opinion, it's a very hard language to learn. And I could explain to you why, but it's harder to explain because it means it, it's because my English grammar, not so good. <laughs> We have to learn ISS systems. This is the biggest, the Russian is the biggest part of the curriculum, actually. You have to get pretty proficient in a foreign language. But blockwise, you have to learn about this ship, this flying ship of the space station. And the reason is, is because something's going to break, especially the toilet. It's always broken. <laughs> and you can't call the Maytag man, right? Uh, you've got to fix it. We have to learn how to fly the robotic arm. Uh, that's up in Canada at uh, the CSA, learning uh, to fly and grapple. Uh, that's an HTV on the sim. And um, great fun. It, it, and we call it flying the arm because it is. It's much more like flying than computer programming, even though you're doing a little bit of both at the same time. And one of the biggest treats for me as a guy coming in from the service who's already flying, putting on this spacesuit and getting in the neutral buoyancy lab to do spacewalk training, EVA training. This was like flying a jet for the first time. It's clothes and a spacecraft. That's awesome. <laughs> this was one of the most amazing things I've ever done. And what I like about these pictures that I've shown you, it takes an amazing team of people to make this happen. In all of these pictures, even the ones I've zoomed in on, you don't see me by myself. And I know what you're thinking, oh, he's got his back to it, so he doesn't realize the picture that's up there because he's by himself. But if you look in the lower right corner, you're right, that's the head of a safety diver. And if you look in the lower left corner, that's the flippers of another safety diver. Every person in the suit has two safety divers right there. And then there's a float diver who has a camera. And that camera is not, you know, we do take lots of videos and show you know, for presentations. That guy is there so that the test conductor and test director can see to make sure things are safe. So that's three people just dedicated to you, and they rotate out every two hours. And the reason I'm talking about this is because it's such a team effort. It's not about the two people in the suits. It's about the 40 people making sure that you're safe. And then we get down underwater, and we go to work training to make repairs on the International Space Station. And I've got a little video uh, that talks about the teamwork that it takes to, to make this happen. So what you see top left, that's float camera one, that diver I told you about with a camera looking at EV1. The top right is the float camera number two looking at EV2. The bottom left is the camera of the EV member looking back at the float diver. And the bottom right is the same for the other guy. So it's kind of a confusing, but it'll make sense as you see. Hey, the guy you want safe dash EV1, two, how do you copy safe dash? Copy one, copy two, go to backup. Speakers in the water so the divers can hear. You saw them give thumbs up. And safe dash on backup, how do you copy? 
First thing we do is comm checks because it's about safety. That was a comp. Say again for AV1. AV1, two, copy. AV1 has your loud clear. AV2 has your loud clear. Thank you. That bro. break right there is exactly why I chose this clip. On this dive, that will come into play later. And the comp was cutting in and out. And it cut in and out, I'll tell you after this video uh, is done playing, but at a crucial time. So once we get done with the comp checks, we get an initial wave. They put our portable life support system simulator on. And we have to go hand over hand down this line to the bottom of the pool for a reason. Because if we have a problem, you see me hold my fist up there, my ear would not clear, and I'm putting my nose on my Valsalva block and clearing my ear. Just like when you fly in an airplane, that uh, Valsalva maneuver to clear your ears, I'm doing the exact same thing here. It cleared, and I didn't have any more problems, but they make us motor ourselves down to the bottom of the pool for that exact reason, so that no one gets hurt. Then once we get to the bottom, the divers take you over, and they do the way out. And this part is my favorite, actually. It's, this is a lot of fun, because you sit there and they add foam and weights to not just make you neutral so that you don't rise or sink, but they also don't want you to twist. This is what's playing underwater. All of us can hear this music. So you see, he pitched his feet up. They want you to stay in that position. That when you, it's not just putting up and down. I have to get on my side to make sure it like that. job in the pool. We're underwater for six hours in the suit. It's running a marathon on your hands. It's tiring. But the divers have the toughest job and it starts right there. Um, I, I love showing that clip because it kind of condenses so many of the important things, you know, teamwork and communication. Um, you know, th this, this was like flying for the first time, like I said. And if you can't tell, I have so much fun. Just watching this video, I'm sitting here having a good time. Well, I felt the same way in the water. I'm bobbing my head to the music and I'm having a good time. And it's interesting, when I take my kids somewhere, we went to Six Flags with my daughter's choir. Oh boy, me and a bunch of junior high school girls and I was the chaperone. And before we hit the park, I told them, I said, I have one rule. What's my rule, what's my rule? My daughter says, that we have fun. I said, but how do we have fun? Nobody gets lost. Everybody has a buddy, and we stay safe. Because if we do those things, then we have fun. And that's the reason that I can sit in the water and, and enjoy myself, because we're all trained, we communicate, and we all have a mission to accomplish. And if we're all doing that mission, we're going to have fun. And we're going to do good work. But we're going to have fun, too, which is important to me. And then, obviously, T-38 flying. That's the last part of the syllabus that you have to complete to graduate from astronaut candidate training. This is a clip from our Remembrance Flyover 15. We did the same thing this year, but I use this clip because it shows much more of the coordination and teamwork that it takes to do formation flying.
can you not love working for this agency? Boy. <laughs> so we also did a lot of other things. We went to all the different centers to learn about what we do here. We went to SpaceX. We went to Virgin uh, Galactic and to Scaled Composites. We went out hiking and studied geology and planetary science. We also have this curriculum about learning about each other and about ourselves so that we can be better teammates because long duration space flight, uh, you're living in a four bedroom apartment for six months in very close proximity to five other people. So you better be uh, a good person to live with, right? You don't want to have those roommate problems. <laughs> Some of you had that roommate or you were that roommate. <laughs> so. Uh, and so this is a bunch of pictures from different events that we did. And I mentioned the expeditionary training that we do to learn about each other, learn about ourselves. And we sort of had a graduation event. We went out to the National Outdoor Leadership School, one of their campuses in Lander, Wyoming. And we hiked Wind River for nine days, stayed out there eight nights. This picture is very special because we hiked East Temple Peak and we summited all together. Another picture I almost put in there is us walking up to the peak, holding hands. And then we sat and took this picture pointing east. The last group of astronauts to go there was the crew of Columbia. And we did this picture for them. So that's a special moment. So all of that training was to help us to really understand the agency and what we have to do and what our job is as astronauts, flyers, operators, uh, no matter what we come from, you know, what background that we come from, military, educator, science, physics, we're all operators. And I like this picture. Anybody know what's in the, that picture? Shout it out, anybody? You better, somebody better. <laughs> Say it, speak up. <laughs> no? Nope. New Horizons. Pluto. And? Sharon. And I like this picture because for me, it synthesizes what I've been trying to do in those two years is understand the gravity of NASA's mission, vision. We change the way we see the world, the universe, and ourselves in it. And that's, that's really what we're trying to get our minds around. I mean, like I said, we're operators, but we're also ambassadors of this agency. And I love the fact that I'm a, I'm a military guy. I'm, I was in the Navy. The Navy's bu budget is $180 billion-ish or so. The DOD is $600 billion. NASA's $18 billion, sorry, FY16, what, $19.5 billion? It's a, it's a fraction of what we spend on defense. But with that, we change people's perspective. That's amazing. And I'm thrilled to be a part of that. So we graduated July of last year. And we've all been assigned different jobs, ISS operations, ISS integration, safety, uh, working in EVA and robotics. And I work in the exploration branch. And I'm the crew office representative for ground systems development and operations, which means I have to come here a lot. Yes. <laughs> I, I love my job. I really do. If I haven't said that before, I love coming here. Um, and so the eight of us started together. We finished together. And there's no guarantee until you get your pin you know, the office is like, hey, you might not be here. If you don't pass astronaut candidate training, you're going back to wherever you came from. And uh, I don't know if that's ever happened, but it's like, you know, you, you feel that little bit of pressure. You don't want to be that first person that like, hey, I, I didn't I know you're coming back to the Navy. Uh, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and so hopefully you enjoyed that. that that's kind of the two years in a nutshell. And um, like I said, my job has been to get to know the agency. I, I've been in the Navy 18 years. I've been in NASA for two and a half. And so I'm still a new guy. I heard we've got a bunch of interns in the room. There are probably some of you that have worked for NASA longer than I have, you know. I met an intern that was like an intern intern and like pathways and that for four years. I'm like, man, I need to ask you some questions. Uh, so um, and of course, picture. I won't take a picture with you guys. So. I didn't uh, know what the theme for today was, but I wanted to share that with you anyway, so even if I knew I was going to do that anyway. <laughs> but I do want to share a couple of little thoughts about things. And like I said, I, I, I feel like we're family, you know? And as family, you can talk about things that might be challenging, you know? And so uh, that's what I'm going to do. This is stuff that I thought about for the 18 years I've been in the Navy. People have talked to me about. And so, 
I want to just share some thoughts with you. This time of year, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of the remembrance ceremonies and this is this is the way I, I'm a little bit of a strange person I know I wrestled in college I told you I may not have all my marbles but this is the way that I think about things and I want to start with this quote because I feel this way about the Navy I feel this way about my sports teams that I played on about Cal Poly my alma mater about the Navy if I didn't say that I feel this way about my family and I feel this way about myself personally and I'm reading this book by General Stanley McChrystal, the man credited with revamping special operations in the Middle East in the fight against Al-Qaeda. And um, in the introduction to the book, he makes the point that all of those great things that we did, they're not going to just stay by themselves. If you stop, just like the fitness that keeps our soldiers able to take it to the enemy, it's not going to last. And worse, it's not even going to stay where you left it. If you stop pushing, it will roll backwards. And I love this quote because he's talking about organizations, but fitness is also tied into here. And all of that stuff that you saw in the videos, it requires fitness. And I like to talk about all of mental, physical, and spiritual. It's very important. And so I love the fact that this quote synthesizes all of those things. And so as a new guy, I want to share a little bit about a, so an observation that I've had in these two and a half years. I came from the Department of Defense. The average solar sailor, sailor airman and marine is 18 to 27, gung-ho, a little more physically fit, emotionally fit, and spiritually fit than the average person. Because you do a job that potentially has existential consequences. You may be told, go take that hill. That might be your Mount Suribachi, and you might not come home from that. And so that pushes you to be the best that you can be. And that commitment to excellence, mentally, physically, and spiritually, is important. And I think they're connected. I think they're connected. All of those things that we do, the physical fitness piece of it is very important. Flying in high-performance aircraft, your ability to adapt aerophysiologically. I didn't make that word up. Somebody else <laughs> take credit for that, but that's what they say. Pulling G's and being upside down in your you know, vestibular system, the inner ear, that stuff is, that transition is eased by being aerobically and anaerobically in shape, having muscles and a strong heart. Well, that actually applies to sitting in these meetings. Again, if you haven't been to a GSDO meeting, come, come with me next time I come back. I'll be here in March and you can see what I'm talking about. Um, but it, it, it helps your ability to deal with stress physical or emotional stress. And so take that for what you will. They're all important, mental, physical, and spiritual excellence. Or emotional, if you don't like that word spiritual, emotional excellence. So, but this, this quote also makes me think of two, two challenges that I have to take on. One is, you've probably heard this term, the gray wave. The aerospace industry uh, is retiring faster than we can replace it. The baby boomers are retiring, and business and marketing are becoming more popular than science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So we are having trouble replacing you. So we have to tell our story better. You know, If you've seen that movie, uh, the Mark Zuckerberg movie, he's a techie, but that guy's good at telling his story. Michael Bloomberg, that name, he's an electrical engineer. I think he's electrical. He's an engineer, okay? Apple CEO. These kind of guys, they're really good at telling their story, and it makes them commercial successes. But each one of us needs to be better about telling our stories so that we can inspire the next generation. Remember that picture up there in the top right corner of my wife and I talking to those kids about what you do? We have to do that. It is not optional. This today is optional, but that's not optional if you want our country to succeed in this increasingly interdependent world that we live in. There are not enough jobs in the science and technology workforce in this country to hire every engineer coming out of India and China. So we have a challenge. The second thing that it makes me think of, if you are one of those baby boomers, you are that much more important. We need you. We need you in the fight. I know this is not a fight. I'm a Navy guy, I'm sorry. 
but we need you. It's even more important. Back to my comment earlier, mental, physical, and spiritual excellence. We need you to be healthy so that you can be here because your mind and your motivation walk around in this. You only get one vehicle to walk this earth in and we need you to take care of it because we need you here. Okay, enough of this slide. I, I, but this is very important to me. This is the way that I think, and I'm sorry if this is a little strange and preachy. I'm not, I don't mean to preach. I'm just sharing the way, that, the way that I process things. This time of year, we do this. And this is how I process this. You know, we, we take time to, I'm a Puritan, Apollo 204. We think about Apollo 204. We think about STS-51L, STS-107. But I think the word remember, it, it, it's, it's not just an intellectual activity. It cannot be, it, it, not for us. For the people outside the gate, that's okay. In the Bible, and I'm just gonna read this to you. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. And he observes himself, but goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer, a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. I'm not saying this to preach at you. What I'm saying is the Bible, which was written over a period of 1,600 years in a whole bunch of different places in a bunch of three different languages, captured this a long time ago. But scientists are saying the same thing. I know in this room, this quote actually might impress some of you more. A neuroscientist from Johns Hopkins was interviewed last year on NPR. Yes, I listen to NPR. And the interviewer asked him that question that we would all ask a neuroscientist if we met one. What do you do to take care of your brain? And he said, I move my body. I do things. I get out and I get active. Get out of your chair and do something. Whoa, uh, my comment earlier, mental, physical, spiritual excellence. But here's the reason I put this slide here now. To remember, the Bible said it. Do not be forgetful hearers, be doers of the work. This guy is telling you, you gotta do things to improve cognitive function. Your brain is connected to your body's ability to do physical work. That's deep for me. So when I think about remembering, I personally think of what I'm gonna do in remembrance. And here are some things I challenge you. Very high level, I'm not gonna get into details. I don't wanna preach at you, but this is what I've committed to. Communication. It is the foundation of any successful team. Goes without saying. If you ask my wife, though, I'm not very good at it, so I still practice a lot. <laughs> Teamwork. I told you I started this off with a big hug from Johnson Space Center because we're a family. My family is the most important team in my life. My country is an important team. I'm a military officer. NASA is a very important team. But you know what? We all are stewards of the public's resources. Their people and their treasure. So this, we have to, the, the public doesn't have time for us to not get this right. Yeah, we have our little sibling rivalry type things, but when it comes down to the mission and getting the work done, we are a team. And the last, like I said earlier, commitment to excellence, mental, physical, and spiritual excellence. These are the things that I think about this time of year when we start talking about those folks. And that is it, I hope, that I left you with something that you think is useful as we work on making the future reality. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So thank you, Victor, for uh, sharing and uh, letting us get to know you better. Um, we look forward to seeing you more in those exciting GSDO meetings. Yes. And um, you're all welcome to come join me. And we really look forward to the day when we're going to take you out to the pad and put you on that spacecraft and want you to fly up there. You and me both. Awesome. So here's a challenge coin from my organization that I'd like you to have to, to remember this visit. And Thank, you. The Thank you. Thank you. And I will put one in the mail for you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Being told we do have some time for questions, so 10 minutes. 
Any questions? You don't have to wait on the mic. You look like you want to ask a question. No? Sure. OK, so uh, I, I Hi. It's a small question, but I think I noticed when you showed your first picture of you as an astronaut that your wings were silver, and it looks like they are gold now. I was wondering if there was a difference in the color at all. This is not a small question. <laughs> <laughs> Army pilots, Air Force pilots, they wear wings of lead. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Silver, silver. <laughs> Even in the Olympics, what is that? Second place. <laughs> I'm a naval aviator. We wear wings of gold <laughs> only. No, it, they, I don't know what picture, but they, these are the only wings that I've ever had are wings of gold. And if you ever notice, so the code here, when you've got the yellow border with the blue background, that's Navy. You'll see the blue with a white background, that's Army or Air Force. And if you see a red background with the yellow border, that's a Marine. And then it, the blue and white is also for civilians as well. But the military folks wear name tags that are representative of their service. Great question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? On the <clears throat> class picture, I noticed that it was 50% guys, 50% girls. Is that, it, has it happened before, or is it first time, or? It is a first, by a long shot. It's like trying to run 100 against Usain Bolt. They wasn't even close. Uh, I think uh, we, being 50-50 uh, is significant, and it was intentional, and hopefully a sign of good things to come. Um. One of the things I remember most on my uh, journey in the Navy was um, watching new pilots come in and learn how to land on carriers. How many bolters? I have a little over what, 400 landings, so probably a little over 400. I don't. <laughs> I mean, what I meant to say, how many bolters before your first success? OK. So this isn't something to brag about, but my first try, I landed on the carrier. But I showed you that picture. We target the three wire. You intentionally pass one and two to hit number three, and then four is there, because sometimes the hook hits the deck and bounces and just happens. My first arrested landing was on that one wire. The problem with that is, on a planned landing, that normal spot I landed on that good one, my hook crosses the ramp 12 feet. That's normal. So if you hit a one wire, your hook is, and, and that round down, we call that the round down, the back of the ship, it doesn't lose the fight. If you hit it, it wins. So it wasn't a good thing that I trapped that first one. It's better to bolter. We call that a no grade pass if you hit that one low. And that's a worse grade. Every landing is graded. Another thing that requires a team, there's a whole, the equivalent of a civilian airport air traffic control tower on the carrier. But then, because it's still such a combination of art and science, there are gentlemen that stand on the back of the ship with no headgear. They have their sunglasses, but no earplugs, because they're looking at you to see if you're three degrees above the horizon. They're looking at the movement of the ship, the movement of your airplane. They're also listening to your engines. And they're the ones that tell you, power, right for lineup, come left. Or if you're looking oh, what I call a four quadrant approach, on the ship there are these TVs that everybody watches when people are landing. And they've got a crosshair. And if you have an approach where you wind up in every quadrant, they hit the button and send you around. And the reason they do that is so that you start adding power. That way, when you bolter, you have energy on the jet. So boltering is not a bad thing. Being low is worse than boltering. Great question. And thank you for your service. Thank you for yours. Um, I've, I've flown out of um, Patrick Air Force Base, and I, I had a problem with ground effect. Um, does the fighter pilot, the, the planes that you fly have problems with ground effect landing on the carrier? And then the next question is, um, you're pretty excited of going to Mars. What does your wife think about that? <laughs> hey, we just became family, OK? We don't, uh, you know, my wife just, it, it, as long as, you know, she knows if NASA does it, we're, we're going to do it right. And uh, we're not trying to send anybody out there one way. So now, you know, I, I, I'm a realist. I, I just want to fly in space, whether it's 250 miles up or 240,000 miles away or 
however far towards the moon or towards Mars we get in my time, I want to do my part to move the ball forward, right? So I'm excited to fly, and my wife knows. We've been in the Navy 18 years. She knows that I'm not going to sign up for anything crazy because I want to be there with my girls and her. So she's, she's excited. She's excited because I'm living my dream, and she knows that this makes me happy. But the time that we spend apart is the time that we spend apart, right? Um, ground effect. It affects all airplanes. Uh, we just happen to have this other thing called afterburner, and we just run out of it. You know, interesting though, at the ship, at the ship, something called the burble. This is like, in, this is even more inside than the name tag thing, the burble. It is the complex interaction of the ship, water, weather, and your airplane. When you land at a big airport behind a, a, a jumbo jet, that wake turbulence can last for minutes. We have to wait four minutes. Well, you have an aircraft carrier moving in front of you. It's either going 30 knots to create wind, or if the wind's blowing, it just points into it. Either way, there's this giant structure 80 feet off the water standing in front of you. So as you come behind it, water, wind goes up over it, and then it comes down and does like this. It creates a miniature version of mountain turbulence. And what it does, it, bring, it pushes you up at the wrong time. So you want to pull power. And then when it does, it sucks you down. And you want to add. So it can create uh, a problem landing. But we learn. We train through that. We have, the only place to see it is at the ship, though. But it, yeah, the burble. So it does, uh, it does have an effect on us at the ship as well. And then once you get over the back of the ship, you actually fly over the steel deck of the ship for 100 feet or so, you still have ground effect. I have a question for you. Are you on? Go ahead. I think uh, this gentleman and go ahead. Um, I've been with NASA for many years. I've known a number of astronauts, but I never asked this question of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> From going from astronaut candidate to astronaut, what do you have, uh, testing, or what, what do they do to say you are now an astronaut from candidacy to, ca to astronaut? You say a year and a half, two years. What do you have to do? You have to complete the syllabus, which is those five areas I talked about, the foreign language training, ISS systems, robotics, flying the T-38, and spacewalking. You have to attain a certain level, actually, in each one of those. There's all kinds of other ancillary training it's a pretty packed two years. It's like going to graduate school and flight school at the same time. And also, most of us are at the age where we have families and other things going on. You know, we're not new in our careers. Um, and then once you do it all, uh, they give you an astronaut pin. Um, so it's not like 70 you pass, right? Hmm? It's not like you 70% uh, you pass. No, it's, it's, it, there is a very high standard. They, you know, nowadays, we don't have specialties. There are no mission specialists or pilots, or robotics operators, and EVA spacewalkers. No, everyone who flies on the space station has to be qualified to do everything, from speaking mission to spacewalking. So that's why it takes two years now. The astronaut candidate training is a little longer now than it was uh, for the shuttle era, majority of the shuttle era. So it's because they pack a whole lot into it. And when you finish, you are eligible to be assigned for a space flight. All right, I have a question for you. I've been out here a while, too, 35 years. So I've uh, met a lot of astronauts. Um, first question is, which a lot of people always remember, do you know where you were when Space Shuttle Challenger blew? That's the first question I have for you. And the second question I have is, did you grow up wanting to be an astronaut, or as time went on in the Navy, you decided you wanted to apply for it? That's a great, oh, that's a string of great questions and they're connected. I was in fourth grade, I'm a Californian, grew up in Southern California most of my life. We moved a lot, not because I was military, but because we were broke. <laughs> and uh, I happened to move to Texas. We were living outside of Dallas. And I was 10 years old, I was in fourth grade, and we were at school, and we had a, an assembly in the cafeteria. We knew something had happened. They, it, they brought it up and we got to watch on TV. And the first time I saw a shuttle launch, I thought, I want to I wanna fly that. I wanted to be a policeman, a fireman, a stuntman. My father was a policeman. And I wanted to be a shuttle pilot, which means you had to be an astronaut. OK, I want to fly that space shuttle. But that was sort of one of those childhood fantasy things. That event and happen, happening to be in Texas was probably one of the most profound feelings that I had as a kid. We sat in the, in the, in the cafeteria. And it was sad, right? I, I understood it was sad. 
But when I looked around and saw not a dry eye, and I'm talking to other students, but the administrators and teachers as well, I thought, whoa, this is a whole lot bigger than I realized. And so, but, but it did stay in the realm of childhood fantasy for me for a long time. And my, I would say the, the tipping point for this decision to put the eggs in this basket and go for it was listening to Pam Melroy talk about her mission. Uh, they, that was the one where when we extended the solar array, it tore. And they went out there and made it happen and fixed it. And that is still on orbit. That little white speck you see on the solar array is their repair. Listening to her in person talk about that and the people that she worked with and how much she admired what they brought to the fight and who they were, I didn't hear one of the technical things that she said. If you can't tell, I'm not a big techie. I'm an operator. And that really stuck with me. I was in the Navy. I was in test pilot school at the time. And I thought, wow, yeah, I, OK. I don't just want to fly the space shuttle. I want to be a part of that team. Uh, thank you for your inspiring uh, uh, coming to be, visit us also as well. Excuse me, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, me too, me too. Yeah. Uh, I also want to tell you my, my background. My father was also Navy. And uh, of course, my brothers and I all went Army. Uh, I was Army Aviation, 27 months in Iraq. Um, but I wanted, I did want to add, uh, thank you for your service, sir. Um, I also wanted to ask a question. As far as the, I'm one of the Pathways interns here as well, so I'm a mechanical engineering major. And as far as the new class that's coming here to KSC this coming year, I'll, I'll, we're obviously very, very veteran heavy. Um, many of us are Army, Air Force, Marine Corps veterans. So what would you say as far as us bringing up the next generation of NASA, as far as engineers, and you know, we're going to be powering a lot of these uh, programs that are coming up, and with our uh, previous military experience, what would you say as an inspiring word for what we should do as far as our long-term goal at NASA? Those three things I told you for me is how I do in remembrance. You guys have context of interleaving, interweaving that into an organization, no matter what you did in the military. And that experience is valuable here. They asked me to be the class leader of our astronaut candidate class. And I was like, yeah, sure, okay, fine. We don't need a leader, so whatever, you know. And, and it turns out, leadership is, is it's valuable. It, it's always needed. And you can lead by example as a new guy. One of my classmates is one of the best leaders I've ever met. And I watch him work, and I'm just amazed. She is a phenomenal leader, technician, operator. And so even though she doesn't have any position of authority, people in our office learn from her. And that's true, and she's military. And so I think you bring something to the fight. You bring something from the fight that is valuable and needed no matter where you go, which is why Fortune 500 companies recruit you like they do. Leadership. Oh, hi. Thank you so much for coming. Um, first, I want to say I'm also from um, the Inland Empire, too. I grew up in Ontario as well, went to Chafee High, so oh, represent. Oh, OK. Well, we, well yeah. Ontario High School. It's all That's our cross town Empire. rivals. Yeah, so. we're, we're rivals, <laughs> but it's all right. Um, I just wanted to ask, you had mentioned, so for all the astronauts now, there's no more specialists. Everybody's trained in the same thing. So how do they assign um, people to flights if everybody's sort of, you know, good at the same thing. If I knew that, <laughs> you would be on the next flight. I would be up there right now. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. Now, people still have their background. I mean, one of my classmates is a doctor who also graduated from ranger school. He's an army ranger doctor. You can kick your button and fix it. Um, five of us are graduates of test pilot school. One is a physicist, Navy test pilot. One is an uh, Air Force flight test engineer. Uh, you know, the, our backgrounds are still important, and I'm a pilot, I fly T-38s, some of us are not front seat qualified, we're rear seat qualified. You still have your specialty, but what I mean is NASA didn't hire us to be program managers or engineers. We are operators, and so you still have skills that you bring to the fight, uh, and those things I think matter as we try to utilize the station more for research, the researchers in our office have a much greater say, and it's not just about that six months that you're on the station, but the way we think about the space station is affected by those scientists and researchers that we have on the ground. They affect the way that we train, which affects the way that we perform on orbit. So those specialties still matter. 
What I'm saying is the roles, we used to hire pilot astronauts and mission specialists. And then there was this other thing called a payload specialist. We don't have that anymore. Everyone is a flight engineer on the station. Long duration space flight, you gotta be a jack of all trades. Uh, I noticed you went, you noticed, uh, you uh, said you went to Air Force Test Pilot School. Well, first, how did the Navy guy get to go to the Air Force Test Pilot School? And two, is what was the most uh, interesting experience you, you got from uh, test pilot school oh yes so we have an exchange program and the Navy's test pilot school is in Patuxent River Maryland and the Air Force's test pilot school is at Edwards Air Force Base California where Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier duh it was a no-brainer I, I applied for the exchange program I'm from Southern California that's I wanted to be back in California and so um, I also wanted to do weapons and avionics systems testing, which is what the Navy does on the West Coast. So after I graduated from Edwards, I went right up the road to China Lake, all in the Mojave, and uh, right across the ridge from Death Valley. And so uh, I, I applied, and I got it. I guess I was the only one that asked for it that time around. But uh, the most interesting thing, wow, such a hard to pull one out of. Such an I mean, I got to fly the Goodyear blimp over Donald Trump's backyard, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's that big. <laughs> it goes slow. I was over his backyard the whole time. Um, there was a week. You, it's, it's a grind. It is, it's graduate education where your laboratory is an airplane, and it's not always the same airplane. That's the thumbnail sketch for test fly school. So you have a lot of writing to do, research, your own MATLAB programming. And again, I'm not a techie guy, I'm an operator. I just want to get in the machine and do the thing. We had a week where I flew in five days, five different airplanes. That's my favorite pe page in my logbook. One of them was a MiG-15. And so uh, that week was, is the, that's why I went to test pilot school. So I think I'm at 42 airplanes. I've flown 42 airplanes. I've got about 2,500 hours total, 400 and so carrier landings. And I love it. I love it. Another thing about that picture, when you see me with my family in front of the F-18, I didn't know it at the time, because I didn't know I was going to get this gig. That was the last time I would fly off of an aircraft carrier. Another reason that that picture is special to me. I love what I'm doing now, but I miss the carrier, the people, the mission. Uh, I do. I would have been very happy going back to the ship and being a squadron commander, or that would have, that's where I would have been in my career, trying to be at least. And so, uh, long answer to your question. That week where I got to fly a bunch of different airplanes, that's why I went to test pilot school. All right, I think we can take one more question in the back. Well, this is an even easy one. I just want to thank you for not only your service to the country, but also for the wonderful presentation that you've given us here this evening. Uh, this afternoon. My question is, why was Russian the uh, language of choice for training? Why not some other language? Why, why was Russian? That's a great question. And uh, I'm happy to be here. That's, this, is, <laughs> this is as good for me. Hopefully I didn't bore you because I had a ball. Um, because the station, the space station is, for all intents and purposes, half Russian. The crew, really. There are three cosmonauts on board at any time. And then the other we call it USOS, which is, you know, could be an ESA astronaut, a Japanese, a Canadian astronaut, uh, or a NASA astronaut. And so those folks, you know, you might have three other languages on the USOS side, but you have three people that Gavarit Paruski on the other side. And so we have to learn it. I think it's so that we can appreciate. It's really more about appreciating the language <laughs> because they speak English better than we speak Russian. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think it's a, you know, it's a part of playing nice uh, as well. All right. We need to let Victor get, get back. Up. <laughs>